Amen and good morning. Thanks. That was awesome. Um, my name is Lee Cadden. I'm our college pastor here at Cornerstone, and we're going to be continuing on week two of a series called One Another. Uh, but before we do that, uh, I'll have some information for you that you may want to know. We have been, over the course of this year, developing a relationship with a church in Tipitapa, Nicaragua, called Christ Our Rock Church. And we have finally, with some conversations with them, nailed down our first official Cornerstone trip dates. And they are a whole lot sooner than we wanted to give them to you. So know that. Here it comes, July 21st through 25th. That's really going to be an on the ground of Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, uh, and then coming back on that Monday. And we have been invited by Marvin and Gretel uh, to come down there. They are the pastor and her husband. And uh, we've been invited to come down and host a VBS. It's not something that's very common in Nicaragua in terms of education of children at that age, but they are excited about it, and we're excited to partner with them in that. So there are only a handful of spots available on each of these teams, and so know that the deadline is not very far from now. It's June 26th. The cost is going to be uh, $1,275 or thereabout, and that completely depends on airfare. Uh, part of it being as expensive as it is for us this time is that we're late in the game getting those tickets, but it's also summer, and summer's always more expensive to travel. So uh, just know that is all based on airfare. Um, and we're just excited. I, I can honestly say I'm very excited about all that God is doing there in that church. I've been once. I'll be going on this trip as well. And um, it's just an incredible opportunity, I believe, that we have to continue doing uh, work with a church um, down there that's been doing work for a long time. And I think that's probably the thing I'm most excited about it is they're on a mission and they've just invited us to come in alongside of them. And so we're very excited about that. There will be another trip uh, scheduled sometime this fall as well. So if this one doesn't work for you, know that we're going to work on getting these trip dates uh, ahead of time uh, in the future. So know that. One another. Week two. We are continuing on uh, through just a handful of these verses in the New Testament, 59 in total, of phrases that include our verses or sections of Scripture that include the phrase, one another, and it's this understanding that we have as the church that we do life together. We have community around us, and, and much of our life involves other people. Uh, I think so much of life, uh, a lot of the times when we find ourselves in a tough situation, is because of relationships, and I believe that our modern television industry really capitalizes on this, especially for guys and on Discovery Channel, Nat Geo, History Channel, those types of, of channels that have all these shows about moving into the Alaskan bush or off the grid or all these other sort of things. And there's this show called Alone. Do you guys know this show? Um, basically, it's a game or it's a contest, uh, if you're unfamiliar with it, and they drop these people off on the most heavily infested grizzly bear island in the Pacific Northwest. And they basically, it's a contest so you can last the longest. And they have nothing but ten things that they choose to bring with them at the beginning of the contest. And whoever's the last man standing is the guy that wins the money. And I'm sitting there watching it going, I could do that. And my life's like, no, you can't do that. I'm like, okay, we, can, we won't do that. But I look at it, and I think so oftentimes when we watch these shows or when we glamorize the idea of places like Walden Pond, or if we look at the life of Chris McCandless, the guy that moved out into the wild in Alaska, and they wrote, they wrote a book and made a movie about it, all of those stories, they kind of tug at our heart in some ways because what we realize when we hear those stories, when we read those stories or watch them, is that that would be easier. If I could just deal with the grizzlies and the rain and the cold and the, the mountain lions and all that sort of stuff, that would be easier than the people that God has put in my life, oftentimes. And we may not say it in as many words, but I think for many of us, we find ourselves in relationships that are tough, that are messy, that aren't always as clean and put together as we would like them to be. And the beauty of the gospel and of scripture is that God's already spoken to that and he recognizes that we are a broken and sinful people and no matter how sanctified we are in this life we're still going to be broken and sinful people and so he gives us incredible instruction in these 59 different one another sayings and so our series is just picking some of those and looking at them and going okay lord what does it look like for me to live with another one one among many in the church so to speak and while I believe that there's part of us that would love to just be alone, and while we may not move off the grid or we may not pack a bug out bag tomorrow, we may co totally isolate ourselves from people. I think a lot of times this isolation for us looks like we're, we're not plugged into a community group or we don't have super close friends because we've spent our entire lives building up kind of parameters or walls that says, 
I don't really need anybody because people are going to let me down or people are going to hurt me or people are going to break or whatever the case may be in our lives. But the gospel in Christ calls us to a different way of living. And I believe that when we choose to stay in relationships with people, especially people who are difficult to love, when we choose to engage people maybe in places that we don't necessarily want to often, two things happen. One, very simply, is that our faith and trust in God grows. That when we choose to say yes to the person that God has put in our life, even when we don't want to, our faith in Him to provide and take care of and protect, all of those things, they grow in our faith. Our faith in Him grows when we do that. But then also at the same time, God's glory is made known to the people around us, the people that are watching, to maybe the person that you're loving. So Christ is exalted and my faith in Him is exalted, so to speak. And so that's what I believe the point of these one another scriptures are. And I believe the focus of our, our, of our time together in um, this series is really focused on is how do we live life together and how do we do that well. So this morning, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4 and we're going to work through uh, two different sections of it. But we're going to start in verse 1. If you have your Bibles and you want to go ahead and turn there, you can do that. We'll stay in Ephesians 4 for the entire morning. This will also be on the screen if you don't have one. Paul says, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all. And in all, Paul is a prisoner literally in chains for the gospel. He's writing to a church in Ephesus that says, I urge you, I plead with you to live your life in such a way that it is worthy of this incredible calling and gift that you've been given in Jesus Christ. You have more in this life than you could have ever possibly imagined, and that is just the start of a life of eternity with him. Won't you live like that? And he goes on and he uses phrases like bear with are phrases where he says, bear with one another with all humility, gentleness, patience, eager to maintain peace. Not always my motive when I go into altercations with people. Eager to build one another up, to bear one another, or to bear with one another in love. Paul is saying, I urge you, I plead with you to live in this way, to live in this manner, because that is what is worthy of the calling that you have received. Why, you may ask, the answer is very simply that you have been loved by, saved by, purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ and your life is no longer your own. So if you're considering this whole Christian life, that's the call and if you're in it, that's the requirement to live your life because it has been paid for for the glory of God and the good of other peoples. If Jesus was willing to die for me, if he was willing to die for you, He was willing to pour his life out on the cross that I might have life eternal in the Father. Then there is no person in my life, colleague, classmate, spouse, whatever, that can wrong me that doesn't warrant forgiveness. Because I have been forgiven much. You have been forgiven much. Now, I'm not trying to downplay any of our situations where we've been wronged, and I'm not trying to make light of pain and brokenness. But what I am saying is that in light of the fact that I have been loved much, the manner that is worthy of the calling that I have received is that I also would love much, that I also would bear the sins of others against me as Jesus has borne my sins. That is the life that is worthy of this calling that we have received. But Paul knew full well that the Ephesians and us thousands of years later needed the reminder He wrote to the Romans this, he said, don't pass judgment on one another. Why? Because you're not a judge. Because you don't have the right to say what is or isn't holy and true, only Jesus does. Or you don't have the right to judge that person's sin in their life because you are just as likely to walk down that road as they're walking down it. Don't stand in judgment against one another. This is the way you should live with one another. But he knew full well that our flesh, our old way of living always has to be right. It always has to make it known when our opinion is right, correct, and yours is not, so to speak. It always puts itself first, but the way of faith, the way of new life in Jesus Christ, which is what we're going to talk about this morning, this whole idea of putting off an old self and putting on a new self, the way of Jesus Christ defers 
to another who stands as judge. It defers to one who is uncreated to be ultimately the one that settles all scores in this life. Faith walks in this manner because it's exactly how Jesus walked. So that is the calling that we've put before us. But we can all sit here and nod our heads, and I can agree with you and say that that's a whole lot easier said than done. Listen, I am a father, I'm a husband, I'm a brother, I'm a co-worker, I share an office with a guy. We're not going to talk about me and Pat. Uh, I, I, share, I share life with people in the same way that you share life with people. And I, and I can say that, that, that relationships, regardless of what you do for a living or what age you are, relationships are tough and they're messy. But I believe that relationships, while they're the hardest thing we do in this life, you can give me a list of tasks, and I can knock them out one at a time, but you give me a group of people, and all of a sudden things change, and they get a whole lot stickier because people aren't tasks, right? They're not projects. They're created in the image of God to be loved as sons and daughters. And I believe that's why the most beautiful things that happen in this world all center and revolve around relationships. So this year, my daughter and I uh, decided, that, well, I decided, and I just roped her into it because she's three, but um, although she loves it, we, we decided we were going to build a garden, and I decided to build this garden in a place that gets the most sun and the least dog and toddler traffic, so that's outside the fence on the side of the house. Well, that's also the part of the house that uh, the previous owner and me during our renovations just threw everything. And so when we started working the ground over there, there were all manner of old roots and, and rotted out trees and golf clubs and golf balls and bricks and large chunks of concrete that I had just thrown over there. I was like, we're not going to do anything over there. I'll just put it over here for now. We start working the ground, and then we start digging all this stuff out only to realize that there's not really any dirt there. So we had to really bring in, or not any good usable dirt, so we had to bring in dirt. And we had to work this whole thing together and... And it was just this incredible mess. But as we started to define the boundaries of the garden and as we started to pull out all of the trash, what I saw was that this mess was the product of this world, but that the work that was going in was much the same way that the work that goes in among relationships. There are things that need to be taken out. There are things that need to be pruned. There are things that need to be cultivated and built up. And I believe that our life in relationships with people, by the grace of God, is just like this garden, that it is often work, and it is every time messy, but that the work that is put in will always result in fruit that is absolutely worth it. And so the challenge of this manner, of this way of life, is to stay and to forgive, to not leave, to not move away from, but to stay and engage people, bearing with one another, being patient with one another, in love, because there is one who has been abundantly patient with us. So if we this morning are to submit to Christ's lordship in this kind of way of walking in love as he would call us, then, then what does that look like? What's the, the practical applications of that for us? And I believe Paul gives us the answer a little further on in verse 17 of chapter 4. He says, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of your minds they are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of their heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality and greedy to practice every kind of impurity. So take a deep breath. We're not going to go through what all these kinds of impurities are. And I believe that while that's a very, really rough description of the Gentiles that Paul is making, what he's actually describing is anyone and everyone who is apart from Jesus Christ. Anyone and everyone who does not have a new way of living is going to continue to live in this kind of way, and you may be able to say, and I can say that, listen, I don't know that I give myself up to the greediness of sensuality, to every kind of evil and impure practice. That's extreme. And yes, it is. Because I believe what Paul is doing is he's drawing a very clear line in the sand that says, listen, a life apart from Jesus looks like this. And if it doesn't yet, it will if you keep going down this road. It's going to end in this kind of way, this deadness, this hardness. And we're going to talk about those things in just a minute, but there is a new way of living that he offers and gives to those who are in Christ, and I believe that that's going to be the subject of our conversation for the rest of our time this morning, is what does it look like for us to put off and put on this new self in Christ, this old life, this ongoing process of recognizing that there is an old man in me that's continuing to try to rear his ugly head 
right? And I believe he always will try to rear his ugly head as long as I live in this body. There are things about my old way of living apart from Jesus that are a whole lot more comfortable than the things that God calls me to in Christ. But that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of our time this morning is what does it look like to put off and put on. But we have to start, I believe, first with what is Paul actually talking about in terms of a character, characterization or a deteriorating life, so to speak, without Jesus. And it's, he, he basically, in Scripture, verses 18 through, through 19, he points out these things. He talks about a hardness of heart and then a darkness of heart. And then he talks about deadness of life and that deadness of life that leads to a recklessness of life while still in this body, though the spirit or the soul in this person is dead because of sin. So I want to unpack very briefly those four things because I believe looking at them will help us look at the putting on of the new self in a different way. In verse 18, he talks about hardness. It comes from the Greek word porosis, which basically means a stone harder than marble. And so what we can phrase that as in our language is, Basically, a heart of impenetrable stone, a heart of dead stone, so to speak, is what Paul is talking about here. And he calls it, or he talks about it in light of an oppression of truth. Now, you may sit here and say, well, I don't know that I've ever actually oppressed truth, or I've got this friend who maybe doesn't really even know much about Jesus, and I don't believe that they're willfully oppressing the truth in their life that has led to this hardness. And I would say that there are two kinds of oppression of the truth. One is willful, where you hear the gospel and you go, nope. That's foolishness. I don't want anything to do with anything that would have me die to myself or anything that sounds morbid like that. So that's a willful oppression of the truth. The other is an unwillful or ignored oppression of the truth. And Paul puts it like this when he starts talking about mankind and all of us who have ever walked the planet after Adam and Eve. He talks about our original sin, our nature that we're born into. And you may or may not have heard that phrase, but this idea that when we are born, we are born with a sinful condition that only Jesus has the capacity to do something about. And so whether willfully ignoring the gospel or ignoring God's revelation of who he is through creation, we are oppressing the truth. Paul puts it this way in Romans chapter 1, starting in verse 18. He says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of people who suppress the truth by their unrighteousness. Because what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, because they are understood through what has been made. So people are without excuse. Now, I'm not saying that in creation that we see all of who God is. That would ultimately come in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the fullest representation of who God is to walk among us to then go beyond us in this life but this revelation that Paul is talking about of creation of looking out at all that God has done and seeing all that he has created it puts every single one of us who walk and live and breathe in this world in a place where we are responsible to respond to the one who did that because I didn't do that That's the point of God showing off in the way that he has with all of creation every day at sunset. Whatever the case is for you in creation that speaks to you and wows you, we have to respond to the creator, and all of it is meant to draw us to him. And if it doesn't, Paul is talking here about an oppression of the truth or a hardness that comes with seeing those things and ignoring them. So there's a story of Napoleon Bonaparte that's pretty famous, and I I came across it this week as I was preparing for this morning, and on the idea of God's revelation of who he is and just the hardness of man. And Napoleon was on a warship in the Mediterranean on a starlit night, and he passed a group of his officers on the deck who were mocking the idea of God and, and his existence and how anybody could believe in someone unseen, far off and aloof as they were claiming God to be. And it says, the story goes, that he stopped and he swept his hands towards the skies and he said, men, we must get rid of these first. And it was this understanding that someone as big and famous and as bent on his own agenda as Napoleon was recognized that he could do nothing about the tides. He could do nothing about where the moon was. He could do nothing about the stars because he didn't create any of them. That even someone as self-consumed and absorbed as Napoleon was recognized that he was not the creator of the universe. And to say that there is no creator of the universe when you look at the universe is the type of hardness that Paul is talking about here in verse 18. He goes on and talks about a a darkness in their understanding, a willful oppression of this hardness towards God, uh, a sort of wandering existence in the dark. Uh, He goes on, then the next one is this deadness, uh, alienated from the life of God, he says. Uh, Deadness is what makes 
things like a shooting in Orlando happen. It's what makes normal, everyday lust, pride, and ego happen. It's what makes the Holocaust happen. It's what makes all the things that have broken this world in the way that they do. Deadness because of sin is what makes those things happen. And then ultimately, a dead life apart from Christ is going to live a reckless life, or as Paul says, a callous life toward sin. There's no, there's no feeling, there's no recognizing of what's right and wrong based on what God has said is right and wrong. This callousness towards these impurities uh, really comes... Uh, with just this growing appetite, right? Like if you're, if you're looking at someone or maybe you're looking back in your life or at someone who's living this kind of reckless life of abandonment towards sin, it's because appetite breeds appetite, right? Like it never stops. It's never satisfied. Sensuality, greediness, lust, all of those things, pride, ego, working too hard, all of those things or workaholism, to, so to speak, everything in this life that's reckless towards sin breeds itself and it just continues on and on and on and on. And I can honestly tell you that without Jesus in my life and creating this new man in me, that this would be me. And I can say that without Jesus, this would be you. And you may look at this list of things and you may think of this recklessness and deadness and hardness and go, yeah, I just don't really see the extremes of that in my life. Well, then I would ask, and this is often the case for me, I would ask all of us kind of a gut check question of, even if we don't go that far, why are we okay with a culture that does? Why are we okay living in a world where the things that grieve God's heart no longer grieve mine the way they should, and they've just become normal? I'm not saying that we can completely change culture overnight, but I am saying that the things that look like this in this world ought to make you weep, if not physically, then in your soul. This is the old man. This is the old way of living. It's why the world is going the direction it's going in terms of its brokenness. But Paul goes on in verse 20 with what exactly we are to do with this imposter that sets himself up to be Lord in our life. He says in verse 20, but this, that is not the way you learned Christ, assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him, as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through evil, through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. This is not the way you learned Christ. This is what you learned in Christ, that you are to first put off the old self. And yes, it's a daily putting off. We'll talk about that in just a minute. And then you are to daily be renewed in your mind by the Spirit. And then with that renewal that you now believe to be true by faith, you are the, to then put on the new self. In verse 22, he talks about this putting off of the old self because it belongs to the old way. It belongs to a dead, hardened, reckless um, life apart from Christ. But you have been saved in Christ. You have been given new hope in him. But every single day you and I wake up in this body or that body, you're going to look at your old way of living as the clothes that just, man, they just feel real good. Like they're the pair of sweatpants she's been trying to get you to get rid of. There's just this way of living that is comfortable and good, and I like it, and it's really just about me and making me feel better. And Paul is saying, no, listen, that's the old way. You have been called to a manner of living, a way of living that is different, that is beyond that. Christ has given us new clothes, and he says, put these things on. The old way leads to death and darkness. These things lead to life and holiness. So put off those things. And in verse 23, he says something I think often gets overlooked, uh, at least it does in my own life when I think about putting off the old self and putting on the new self. He says, be renewed in your mind by the Spirit. I'm not going to wake up today or wake up tomorrow and continue to think about myself in this old kind of way and pretend that I can actually live the life that Christ would have me live. It's like saying you're saved or, or believing somewhere maybe that you are a believer in Christ, but then continuing to think negatively about yourself and about the world and about God. It's about saying that I'm a Christian, but not believing that Jesus actually paid for me, that I might have life, abundant joy, victory over all of these things. He tells the believers that are hearing this letter and people who are considering this call in Christ that, listen, you have to be renewed in your mind on a daily basis because you've got to think differently about 
who God is. He's not a dictator. You've got to think differently about other people. Listen, they're not all out to get you, and even if they are, you have the creator of the universe on your side. Think differently about how you bear it with them, and to think differently about yourself. And maybe for some of us, if pride is our old man, then we need to think less of ourselves. Or, and then if we are, are maybe one of those people who just struggles with image and identity and who we are in Christ, we need to think more of who we are because of what God has accomplished and said is true about those whom he loves. We have to renew our minds to think differently. And I believe this is the sticking point for many people. I think this is where we really get hung up on actually putting on the new self on a daily basis. It's because we don't think like we are new creatures. And so it's this prayer every day. God, renew my mind to believe what you say about yourself, to believe what you say about me, and to believe what you say about the people who are in most need today of being loved through me. And then finally in verse 24, once your mind has been renewed, he says, put on the new self. The fact is, as Christians, you have been given the new self. It is not yours to weave or create. It is ours as believers to be worn, to be put on, to say yes to this and no to this because of the renewing of my mind that I now know to be true in Christ Jesus. We receive the old man at birth. We are given the new man at our salvation, and every day between my salvation and the day Jesus comes back, or I go there, is the day of putting on, or the opportunity to, of putting on this new self. So be renewed in your mind, Paul says. Put on this new self. Think in this new kind of way. I believe that if, and imagine this with me, I believe that if we were to look at our lives, our witness, our testimony, and we were to be as concerned with putting on this new self as we are in putting on new fashion, the new styles, that our lives would look completely different. That the world around us would be changed because we cared about the things that God cared about on a daily basis. And that's choosing to put on this new man. The gift is new life. It's been given. The work is the putting it on. The putting off, the being renewed, showing up, spending time in his word praying, all of those things, worshiping here, worshiping tomorrow, worshiping on Tuesday in your homes, being renewed by this new man that you are putting on. And the point, the fruit of putting all of this off is the rest of chapter 4 as Paul goes on. He says in verse 25 that when we do this, we would speak the truth in love to our neighbors. When When we become angry, because we're going to become angry when we're wronged, that we would not allow it to fester, but that we would deal with it quickly that we would not let any corrupt speech come out of our mouths towards others but we would build others up in love speaking grace to others because we have that power with our words right that we would in verse 31 take off bitterness we would take off anger we would take off slander and then in verse 32 that we would put on kind heartedness that we would be kind to one another that we would be tender and gentle bearing with one another and loved when we are wronged we would be quick to forgive instead of quick to seek our own agenda and vengeance. Paul pleads with the church to be a people who live lives worthy of the calling that they have received. And then he says, this is how you do it. You put off, you put on, because you have been loved, you have been saved. And the question in all of this is why? Like why in the world does this matter? And it matters because I'm going to have to deal with you this week. And you're going to have to deal with me. And we're going to have to love people because God in his sovereignty didn't save us and immediately take us to heaven. God knows that would have been easier and less messy and faster. And we could get on with this whole kingdom coming kind of thing. And it would be here and we would all be in bliss with Jesus Christ. And while that would be true, it isn't the way we find ourselves, right? God in his sovereign wisdom chooses to leave all of us here for a time, for a season. We don't get to decide what that season is. And for most of us, we lose loved ones far sooner than we thought was the right time. But God knows all things, and we believe that. And we say, okay, God, if you wake me up tomorrow and the day after that, and for whatever length of time you leave me here, I want to live a life that is worthy of the calling that you have received, yes, or that I have received, yes, because I believe that it's making me more holy. And yes, I believe that's a good way to love other people but also because I believe that the world is watching. 
that there are people who you work with, who you go to class with, who you sit next to, who maybe you live in the same home with, who are not believers, and they're watching the things you say and the way you live. And if they're looking at you and you claim to have this new life, but your new life actually looks like your old life, which actually looks just like their life, then, then why does it matter for me to live any differently? When Paul says that we are to be kind to one another, patient to one another, bearing with one another and love, he knew full well that the world would be watching all of us who did it. When Christ calls us to live in this kind of way, the kingdom grows when we love someone who is not lovable between the two of us, within, that, within me and within that person, but also within everyone who is watching. And so I praise God for the opportunity that he gives us to do that. We do all of this life together, the joys, the happiness, the love, the birth of children, marriages, everything in this life that we love, but we also endure pain and heartache and brokenness and sickness and eventually death in this life. And we do it all together. Everything we do is to be with one another. And I pray that as the world watches, as your coworker watches, as your son watches, as your daughter or spouse or colleague or classmate or roommate watches you, I pray that they would see you putting on your new self. I hope that they see you speaking life and not death. I hope they see you building up and being kind to one another and being quick to forgive and bearing with one another's sins because your sins have been born with in Jesus Christ and you're going to live your life like you believe it, being renewed in your mind. And I pray that they see you living in light of this truth, that you were dead, hard, reckless in your old way of life, but you have been made new, and you have been given this new creation, and you have been called to live a life that is abundant and for the kingdom coming in this world, a grace-filled life as Jesus is teaching you to walk in a manner that is worthy of the calling that you have received, truly teaching you to just walk like he did and to love people as he would if he were you. And because of that truth, we love, we forgive, we bear with one another, we are patient with one another because there is one who has been abundantly patient with us. Amen? All right, let's pray. God, I thank you for the fact that you didn't look at our sins and, and wash your hands of us that you looked at our brokenness and our pain and our sickness and all of our, our sin-caused problems in this world, and you said, I know exactly how to deal with that. And you came and you lived among us and you showed us how to live a life, but then you died so that we could have the life and the power, through the power of your Holy Spirit and grace, to live a life that is worthy of the calling that we have received in you. And so, Father, in that we rejoice and we worship you and we praise you and we recognize that in this life it's going to be really easy to put on our old ways of life but that by your spirit you renew us if we'll show up by your spirit in our lives you are renewing our minds to see things the way that you see them to see people the way that you see people to see ourselves the way that you see us as someone that you came to die for and because of that, we put on a new self that says yes to the things of God and no to the things of this world, recognizing that this is a daily and ongoing struggle. And so we thank you for the grace to wake up today and tomorrow and to try again. And for forgiveness of all the places that we've fallen short, Lord, we worship you for that and we thank you for it. We pray that you would shape us and mold us into a greater and greater image of your Son, Jesus Christ, and that our worship with one another here in this place would lead us to live a life this week of bearing with one another, of being patient with one another, and being kind to one another in love. Lord, we love you. We thank you for forgiving us, for loving us, for calling us sons and daughters, and for the privilege that we have to still be on this earth to proclaim that good news to everyone who doesn't know it. And we pray all of these things in your mighty name. Amen.